Okay, then um, I guess good morning to our colleagues uh, in the US at Genelia and uh, good afternoon to everyone who joins here in Europe from EMBL. So it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker of our joint Ember Genelia Bioimaging Seminar today, who will be Zhao Shi Sang. Um, so Zhao Shi studied uh, molecular biology in China, first at the uh, Jilin University, then at Tsinghua University, where she did a PhD in structural biology with um, Professor Haiti Li. Uh, where she worked on structural and functional aspects of protein complexes and their role in epigenetics. She then moved to Europe and more specifically to Dresden to do a postdoc with uh, Tony Hyman, uh, where she worked on biomolecular condensates. And this is also where she got in touch with her current um, supervisor, Julia Mahamid. Um, and so she joined her lab when Julia was setting it up here at EMBL. And now she continues here as a senior postdoc. And today um, she will tell us probably about her more recent work in cellular cryo-electron tomography um, to study both biomolecular condensates, but also the role in viral replication. So it sounds really interesting and I'm very much looking forward. Thanks again for um, joining this seminar series and for presenting. So please take it away. Thanks a lot to Robert for the kind introduction. And I also want to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to share our story today. So I'm very excited to share our unexpected discovery about stress-induced mumps virus reactivation, uh, which was a cross-scale study enabled by cellular cryo-electron tomography. So when I started my postdoc, I was particularly in interested uh, in the field called biomolecular condensates. As shown in this video, the C. elegans germline uh, granules uh, indicated by the GIP labeled uh, key component of the P granule uh, uh, compartment, they actually behave quite dynamic. They are uh, mesoscale, uh, micrometer scale assemblies containing mostly RNA and RNA binding proteins. Uh, they show this type of liquid-like behaviors fused and fission over time. They are very important for the development of biology of C. elegans. And this was also shown in uh, at a later stage in uh, mammalian cells, the uh, HeLa cell stress granules, when cells respond to heat shock stress, for example. You can see that plasmic assembly of uh, the M-cherry labeled G3BP1, a macroprotein of stress granule. They are also very liquid-like. So these type of compartments, in contrast to conventional membrane-bound compartments, they actually assemble via a mechanism called liquid-liquid phase separation. And in recent years, there are more um, uh, types of biomolecular condenses, which were recently found. Uh, they have multiple functions. They have uh, very different functions, ranging from uh, cell signaling uh, to transcriptional regulation. In, ver uh, in diverse cell types. And what's more interesting is that these components of biomolecular condensates are also related to uh, the development of uh, neuron degeneration diseases. Uh, for example, in this image, you can see in the patient uh, neuron cells, the uh, stress granule component fast actually forms cytoplasmic influence uh, by immunohistochemistry staining. So to understand the molecular basis for the assembly and dynamics of biomolecular condensates and how they might be uh, related to disease development would be very interesting. Um, so uh, what was uh, striking at the beginning of this field was that people found simply by using a purified key component of biomolecular condensates in the in vitro system, people can reconstitute these uh, droplets uh, structure, which recapitulates the behavior of biomolecular condensates inside cell. Normally, these key components contain uh, multi-modular domains, uh, and they have disordered features. And later, people found, uh, although uh, in other types of biomolecular condensates, in the in vitro reconstitution system, they can also uh, uh, observe such droplet-like structure, but they also convert into amyloid-like fibrils, which was speculated to be uh, a link to the disease stage of these proteins. So I was uh, particularly interested to study the underlying structural basis for these uh, mesoscale assemblies. 
uh, first in vitro and later uh, at a later stage also directly inside cell. So I want to introduce the technique uh, cryogenic transmission electron microscopy, which enabled the study of these biomolecular condenses at high molecular details. So in contrast to uh, light microscopy, as we see in this image, uh, transmission electron microscopy actually uh, use electrons as source and uh, also electron magnets as condenser lens instead of glasses. And then this technique allows a visualization of specimen at molecular details with higher magnification. Um, but apparently uh, with this technique, we cannot image light cells. We have to fix them either by chemical fixation or uh, flash freezing. So um, chemical fix sample has the advantage of imaging the specimen at room temperature. Uh, but the flash uh, frozen samples uh, although um, technically more challenging, actually allows uh, preservation of the high resolution information uh, of the structures inside the specimen uh, while the specimen was imaged at minus 185 degrees Celsius. So um, in order to image uh, biomolecular condenses, which is actually a relatively thick samples for the electrons to go through, uh, uh, I took the advantage uh, of a branch of the cryo uh, TEM technique, which is called uh, cryo electron tomography. So in this case, I can use the state of the art transmission electron microscope called Titan cryos, but tilt my uh, specimen containing the biomolecular condenses at a range between minus plus 70 degree. And by getting the projection views of the biomolecular condenses, we can later computationally reconstruct these projection images into a three-dimensional volume in order to see on the molecular resolution details uh, within the uh, biomolecular condenses. So we have recently written uh, a step-by-step -step protocol about how to uh, image biomolecular condenses with cryo-ET technique. Um, so I have imaged multiple types uh, of biomolecular condenses. For example, um, first I, uh, very, uh, I observed the uh, condenses assembled by stress granule protein G3 BP1 in presence of RNA. And we can see in this image, there is indeed detailed, uh, detailed feature within the condenses. For example, the cluster-like structures or some uh, sort of beads on string structure. And we can even visualize very thin RNA fibers at the periphery of the condensates. Uh, however, uh, if uh, we look at another um, fast protein condensate, which is also a component of stress granule, here this condensate looks very different from the one on the left image. It appears totally amorphous. And uh, we also see fibers originating from the periphery, the boundary of the condensate. So both proteins are stress granule components. And then I wondered what type of structure features is actually the physiological structure basis of stress granules in, this, uh, in uh, the cellular context. Uh, so I thought about using a more complicated technique, uh, the cellular cryo-electron tomography to directly visualize stress granules in their cellular context. Uh, so be, before going for uh, the experimental uh, workflow of the cellular cryo-electron tomography, I want to first to show you the potential applications of this technique. Uh, for example, we can actually use uh, cellular cryo-ET to visualize the, um, the uh, molecular machineries uh, at the nuclear periphery inside a HeLa cell, or at a disease context, we can visualize how the inclusion bodies uh, aggregates inside a uh, cytoplasmic region interacting with proteasomes and uh, introduce dysregulation of the function uh, uh, of proteasomes. In another case, we can also directly see the coupling uh, between the macromolecular machineries, in this case ribosome and the polymerase, directly from intact bacteria cell, which is very potential uh, for development of drugs based on uh, cellular uh, structural biology. And 
uh, recent years, we also see this technique is uh, very useful in directly revealing the interplay between the virus and the host. For example, when uh, HIV particle, viral particle uh, entering the nuclear pore, uh, which is of similar uh, size in the diameter. So with these uh, potentially useful technique, we uh, probably wonder how uh, the experiment can be done. Um, but um, there are um, indeed challenges in cellular cryo-electron tomography in comparison to you know, a simplified uh, uh, cryo-ET of the in vitro sample. Um, so in this case, we are looking at a HALA cell from the side view. And you can see a HALA cell is about five to 10 micrometer in thickness. This is um, very thick uh, uh, for the electrons to go through the biological material. So to enable uh, transmission electron microscopy, we first need to thin the section uh, the cells down to a very thin, uh, mil, uh, like ablate away most of the cellular material to only preserve a very thin section of the cell in order to uh, let the sample to be electron transparent. And secondly, um, since I was interested in um, the structural basis of stress granules, how could I uh, locate stress granules within such a large cellular volume? So we would have the challenge of targeting. And uh, within the next uh, slides, I will show you how um, these technical challenges were overcome uh, by our uh, development, uh, development, uh, develop, develop, uh, the, the pipeline develop, uh, developed in our lab. So first of all, um, so crowd electron tomography starts from freezing of the sample, as I mentioned before. So in this case, we have the cells seated on the transmission electron uh, microscopy support termed uh, TEM grease. So uh, we once uh, uh, we induce the formation of stress granules inside these cells monitored by uh, uh, live imaging, we can immediately flash freeze uh, the, the grease with the cell seated on top with um, commercially available devices called VitroBot or like an EMGP2. And by scanning electron microscopy, you can visualize how a grid looks like and how the cells are nicely seated at the center of each uh, square to enable the next step sample preparation. And um, as I mentioned, one challenge of the workflow or the technique is to target uh, stress granules in my project. So when I started, I worked with Leica company to develop a prototype cryoconfocal light microscope. As shown in this image, the main difference between a cryoconfocal light microscope and the room temperature SP8 microscope was actually um, this cryo stage mounted uh, in the optical pass because we need to keep the sample uh, frozen all the time and um, maintained at a temperature of minus 180 degrees. So uh, of course, we also need a transfer toolbox to load our grease with cells frozen into this cryo stage. And when zoom in, uh, we can see uh, how this uh, imaging, uh, the sample is uh, loaded onto the cryo stage. Actually, there's continuous uh, cold nitrogen gas going through uh, the cryo stage chamber and keep the sample at a frozen state and a low temperature. So um, when we image the samples at a cryogenic temperature, uh, meaning minus 185 degrees Celsius, apparently there are more challenges in comparison to the room, room temperature uh, uh, confocal light microscopy. First of all, as we imagine in this uh, cold nitrogen gas atmosphere, um, there is um, potentially a water condensation, which could potentially be deposited to the surface of the grid, uh, especially on the, on the surface of the cell. So this would um, be a big obstacle for TEM imaging, which I will show you uh, very soon. And secondly, of course, we always want to get good image quality. 
But in this case, we also need to take into consideration the time that will be taken to image them, for example, with more uh, averaging or uh, like uh, longer dwell time, because we really want to get image done as uh, as uh, shorter po uh, possible time as possible, uh, because um, over time there could also be contaminants accumulated on the surface of the sample, and um, there could also be drift and vibration during long time imaging, as shown here when we examined with tetraspec bees. Uh, which emit at multiple channel, multi, multiple fluorescent channels. Um, the strategies, the two strategies, scanning between stacks or between frames, actually give very uh, different behavior of the signal. Um, the scanning between stacks, meaning we first uh, image one channel through Z and then different channels, and the second strategy, scanning between frames, means we first image at a fixed Z height and then uh, different channels. And later, uh, we change the Z height to get the Z stack images. So, as we see, um, um, our final purpose of using Crowd Focal is actually to do uh, correlative light and electron microscopy. So, the coordinates of um, the signal among different channels should be cons as consistent as possible to give us the uh, location XYZ co uh, um, coordinate information. But apparently, when we, if we use uh, the first strategy, scanning between stacks, um, the coordinates are not so consistent. And if we go for the second strategy, it seems uh, at least we can get more consistent information about the coordinates of the signal. Uh, but when we look at the images, these two strategies um, apparently have different behaviors. Uh, the second strategy, although it has the advantage of uh, consistent uh, coordinates uh, information, but uh, apparently there could be more vibration and drift happening during the long, longer uh, imaging period. So uh, during um, the experiments, I always need to do image registr registration after uh, data acquisition in order to get them better aligned to get uh, more accurate information about the, the coordinates of the signal. So these are the uh, YZ view of the fluorescent bees uh, uh, in the maximum intensity projected uh, view. And uh, so by developing this uh, microscope and technique, um, it enabled a publication about nuclear pore complex uh, in, in their cellular context in recent years. Uh, so for my project about stress granules, now we can actually use the crowd convocal light microscope first to get the navigator view of the TM grid. And then we zoom in uh, to the individual square to look for the cells. So here you can see uh, the red signal is the M MK2 fluorescently labeled uh, stress granule marker protein FOS. So uh, we can see nicely distributed uh, assembled uh, stress granules inside the cell. And then these green signal is actually the fluorescent bees serving as fiducial markers for the correlative light and electron uh, microscopy pipeline. So we will uh, talk about um, their usage uh, on the next slide. And uh, with this sample, we next can think about the challenge of um, the thickness of the sample. So in order to get a, a thin section of the cell that is electron transparent, we use the device, um, uh, the Aquilos uh, focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy, which has dual beam inside the chamber, allows uh, sample preparation and uh, monitoring of images by SEM at uh, minus 185 degrees Celsius. So uh, again, if we look at a HALA cell, now with this technique, the cryo-focused ion beam milling, we can actually uh, really remove the majority of the cell uh, material and in the end only preserve a thin section of the cell um, at the site of interest in my project, the location of stress granules. So with the three-dimensional uh, confocal uh, 
uh, imaging data acquired from uh, the cryo confocal light microscopy. Now we can correlate the data, the 3D data to this 2D uh, view, the FIB view. So by uh, a procedure of 2D, 3D to 2D correlation, uh, enabled by a, a software called 3D correlation toolbox, we can uh, prepare the scene section of the cell containing the stress granule locations. So um, the resulted sample looks like this. We have two views from the top, the SEM view, and from the side, the FIB view. So we can see the, this scene slab of the cell uh, of a thickness around 200 nanometer uh, now actually contains the location of stress granules. And when we load this um, scene section of the cell, uh, which we call lamella, onto state-of-the-art transmission electron microscope, now we can visualize the lamella uh, part of the cell um, at first of all intermediate uh, magnification. Um, so here you can see the sample is actually heavily covered by these black blobs, which are ice contaminants. So as I mentioned before, in this cryo uh, electron tomography pipeline or cryo uh, TEM uh, technique in general, we want to try to avoid the ice contaminants um, on the sample as much as possible. Um, but luckily, there are still regions corresponding to my um, target structure, the stress granules, for acquisition of the uh, tail series while um, uh, tilting the sample in the microscope. So with uh, the tail series, I can do the reconstruction of the cellular volume into this uh, tomographic data. And when we go through um, the Z um, direction in the XY view of the tomographic volume, we can see conventional um, cellular organelles such as mitochondria, ER membrane ribosomes, microtubule, and actin filaments. So we can really uh, try to resolve these molecular um, structures or cellular organelles to very high resolution. And what was striking to us at that point was we observed a large patch of filamentous structure at the region um, presumably to be the stress granules since we were using the correlative light and electron microscopy pipeline. And when zooming in here, we can see these filaments actually gives repetitive features along the helical filaments, uh, along the filaments um, indicating a helical structure. And the uh, filaments are actually also hollow in the middle. So since we were targeting stress granules, we were uh, very excited to see these um, um, filaments in a large patch. We thought, oh, maybe these filaments are, you know, scaffold proteins and structures of uh, the stress granules. So I next continued to trace these filaments along the central line of these uh, helical structure. I generated equally uh, distant um, points along this helical structure and uh, cropped sub volumes um, along these lines. And then we call them uh, subtomogram particles. And by aligning, uh, computationally aligning and averaging these uh, sub uh, subtomogram particles, I generated an average structure of these helical uh, filaments. As we see in these um, different views, indeed, um, the filaments are helical and it's hollow in the middle. Um, but so my big uh, puzzle was, uh, first of all, what is the identity of these helical filaments? And um, if we can resolve, uh, how we can resolve them to high resolution so that we can know the identity of them and also the potential function of these filaments in putatively uh, the stress granule location. Um, so um, back then when I worked on this project, we actually didn't have an established pipeline to obtain high resolution subtomogram averages or structures of these helical filaments. I had to first go through the biochemical isolation 
of these uh, helicofilaments from uh, the cell lysate. And luckily, I was able to enrich these helicofilaments at 13,000 G palate. And by negative staining TM, we can see here, these filaments are nicely uh, preserved in this palate fraction. And further, by optimized the isolation procedure, I uh, performed sucrose gradient uh, centrifugation experiment and was able to better purify and uh, enrich these helical filaments at certain fraction of uh, my centrifugal tubes. And in this case, uh, I was aiming to um, work with my collaborator, Sinduja, in a sophisticated group to perform quantitative mass spectrometry in order to identify the molecules uh, responsible for um, such helical assemblies. However, over a long time of trials, we weren't able to find any um, potential candidates that can assemble into these helical structures. Uh, we were very disappointed, but I decided to continue to explore more about the property of these helical filaments. And I found by adding uh, an RNA analog heparin, because initially I thought this protein might be at least RNA binding proteins, this actually uh, induced morphological change of these helical filaments from a curved state to a relatively straight state, uh, along with other conditions. So this later enabled acquisition of uh, these uh, tomographic data of the helical filaments. Um, as we see in this, um, uh, this slice view along the dimension, uh, although the helical filament is still sort of uh, curved in the, but with this three-dimensional volume data, I can perform alignment and averaging of these uh, helical structure in order to get a high resolution structure uh, of the filaments. Um, so with this, uh, I worked with uh, a master student in the group, Tim Fluster. We were able to resolve the structure of the helical filaments to about uh, five to six axtrom resolution at the beginning. And from this resolution detail, we could already see, um, uh, actually it's also a, a random encountering of similar structures when we read literatures. We had the suspicion that these helical filaments might be related to um, some nucle nucleocapsid structure of viruses. So although the, the chance was very little, but we still decided to ask our collaborator, Sintuja, to again uh, examine our mass spectrum data with a list of protein, viral protein that may potentially form such helical structures. So we actually <clears throat> were very surprised to see, um, indeed, this is a structure assembled from a mumps virus uh, protein, uh, the nucleocapsid protein of mumps virus. So although I was very shocked, but I still decided to at least validate first if this is um, you know, indeed a virus uh, protein by immunofluorescence light microscopy. So in this image, we can see uh, with the antibody against the nucleocapsid protein of mumps virus, we see all the cells in my cell culture actually contain uh, the mumps virus infection. And later by uh, transcriptome sequencing, we confirmed again the existence of the viral genome in the cell culture and also um, the transcription happening inside these cells. So I had to revise my uh, cell culture model. So in this image, we, we, uh, from this data, we um, postulated that our cell culture model is very likely a persistent infection. Uh, uh, model of the mumps virus, because in all cells, uh, we can see the existence of their nucleocapsid uh, protein uh, shown by the sign color granule. And um, since the cell line I, was, uh, I used was uh, also fluorescent labeled on the stress marker, uh, uh, stress granule marker protein G3BP1, the magenta color, we see on the cells were not actually under any stress from the viral infection um, during the cell culture. So this is indeed a persistent infection uh, cell model 
um, and uh, we suspected um, the viral replication and the host cell immune response were somehow maintained at a balanced state during um, the cell culture and experiment. So you may wonder how the viral, uh, uh, how the uh, viral life cycle of mouse virus actually looks like. So we can see here in this illustration, the mouse virus contains a minus stranded uh, RNA genome encapsulated by its uh, nuclear capsid protein N protein. And this form, this uh, nuclear capsids, which serve as template for uh, the viral transcription and replication. And these events were carried out, are carried out by the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, uh, the L protein of the virus, uh, the virus itself, with assistance from the phosphor protein of the virus. So these gather constitute the core uh, of the viral transcription replication events inside cytoplasmic region termed viral factories or viral replication factories. This corresponds to the sign color structure we see in the immunofluorescence uh, light microscopy images. So um, when um, at that time, I, this was a big puzzle for us, why we initially uh, started to uh, look into the structure basis of stress granules, but it turned out um, we found large accumulation of viral nuclear capsids in the cytoplasmic region, which also appear to be sort of uh, face separated because they do not really have membrane at the boundary of the entire structure but they only locally exist. So this could also serve as a good model uh, for studying the structural basis for uh, biomolecular condenses or compartments inside cell. So we decided to continue with the project. But now, of course, the uh, purpose was a little bit shifted towards um, the viral activity, infection, and stress response. So. Um, we wondered if our persistent cell uh, viral infection model somehow may uh, provide information for understanding um, the viral pathogenesis. So when we looked at literature, uh, it's very interesting that we found persistent uh, mumps virus infection was related to chronic diseases. For example, here I'm showing you chronic myositis. Uh, which is indicated by the weakness of the muscle groups of patients. And we can see in the uh, muscle biopsy of the patients, there is large accumulation of these uh, mumps virus nuclear capsid structure. And when zooming in, we can see these nuclear capsids also appear to be very straight. So we suspected um, or sort of we, um, as we thought um, the, our persistent uh, mumps virus infection model could initially be a stage of the balance between the viral replication activity and the host immune response. But um, maybe by accident, the stress response, uh, the stress treatment actually induced um, reactivation of the mumps virus activity which resulted in uh, observation of the large accumulation of mumps virus nuclear capsids in cytoplasmic region. Because this uh, stress-induced reactivation of viruses have been observed in other types of viruses, for example, human simplex viruses or immunodeficiency viruses. But uh, little was known about the reactivation of RNA viruses, for example, mumps virus under stress response. So um, this, is, uh, very, this was very interesting to us. And we also wondered if there is indeed, indeed uh, stress-induced reactivation of the viral activity, then what, were the, uh, what are the underlying uh, molecular mechanisms? Um, so first of all, we carried out quantification of the viral mRNA and the genomic RNA by uh, quantity PCR experiment. And we found interestingly along the time cost of stress treatment, there's clearly increase in um, the viral transcription and 
uh, replication of um, inside the cells. So indeed, stress can induce the reactivation of these viruses from a persistent infection stage. And then what would be the uh, underlying cellular uh, basis for these uh, reactivation events? When you look at the viral replication factors by immunofluorescence like microscopy, we see along the time course of stress treatment, of course, uh, there is assembly of stress granules, the magenta color structure, but we also observed um, change in the viral factories, the sign color structures. Uh, to be noted, the viral factories in many cases exist in close proximity to um, stress granules. This in a way explains why uh, in our correlative light and electron microscopy experiment to target the stress granules accidentally, we observed the existence of uh, mumps virus uh, replication factories. So the real uh, uh, change in the uh, viral factories in this stress treatment experiment was that we observed continuous increase in the average size of viral factories, which happens concomitantly with a decrease in their numbers. So when uh, this phenomenon of the viral factory largely resembles the behavior of liquid-like biomolecular condensates in their growth phase. So we can see, um, uh, when the condensates go, either by a mechanism called coalescence, uh, meaning um, the, the condensates fuse with each other, or at a procedure named ostward ripening, meaning um, the bigger condensates grow at the expense of um, uh, the dissolution of the smaller condensates. Uh, by either mechanism, the condensates can grow and increase in the size uh, along with the decrease in their numbers. So this uh, phenomenon we call coarsening behavior of uh, the liquid-like condensates. So the phenomenon uh, observed for viral factories in our stress treatment experiment uh, is reminiscent again of the coarsening behavior of biomolecular condensates, indicating the, the viral factories uh, in our stress treatment behave as uh, liquid-like uh, biomolecular condensates. So we wonder then what was uh, uh, the molecular mechanisms underlying such coarsening behavior of biofactories during the stress treatment. Um, so uh, biomolecular condensates are mostly uh, mediated by RNA or RNA binding proteins, which have disordered features shown uh, in this illustration. So when we look at the most abundant protein of uh, the mumps virus, uh, the M protein and the P protein, based on their sequence uh, prediction, we can see uh, the C terminus of the M protein and many regions across the P protein of the virus actually um, appear to be disordered. So we wondered if by transfecting these um, viral genes into the non-infected cells, we could already potentially see the phase separation behavior of the viral protein. So indeed, um, when I transfected the viral plasmids into the non-infected cells, even without any stress treatment, the P protein on its own can form condenses uh, inside that plasmic region. And in presence of the viral M protein, they actually co-localize to form large uh, cytoplasmic assemblies reminiscent of the morphology and the size of the real viral factories in my um, uh, infected cell model. So this shows us indeed the viral P protein uh, can be a driving force for uh, the phase behavior of viral factories during stress treatment. And my recent data, although not shown here, also indicate the P protein can uh, behave uh, as liquid, uh, so can assemble into this liquid-like condensates uh, and fuse with each other under stress treatment, even uh, in this non-infected cells. So um, until now we know, okay, the viral P protein uh, could potentially drive the phase separation behavior of viral factories observed in my stress treatment experiment. 
But then what is actually the molecular trigger or the switch for uh, such uh, coarsening behavior of these condensates? Um, so um, although our mass spectrometry quantification didn't review a change in the intracellular, uh, the total level of the P protein uh, inside cell, but uh, interestingly, we observed there is clear increase in the phosphorylation level of the P protein at uh, this site indicated by the green color. So this phosphorylation site exists at the interface between the viral P protein and the viral polymerase L protein. And uh, based on our structural analysis, due to the complementary surface charge between these two proteins, um, the phosphorylation could potentially enhance the interaction between the viral P protein and the uh, polymerase. Uh, this would uh, facilitate the viral transcription and replication carried out by the viral polymerase machinery. And indeed, later on, by um, many biochemical experiments, we uh, validated the viral uh, NPL protein do form complex. And interestingly, the viral polymerase um, is more enriched into this complex when cells uh, are under stress. And with my collaborator, Sinduja, we further performed uh, solubility uh, quantitative mass spectrometry profiling, which is a technique to review the change in protein solubility at proteome uh, uh, level um, uh, at different treatment conditions. And in this case, we found along the time cost of stress treatment, uh, although most of the viral protein didn't change their uh, solubility property, um, we interestingly found the viral polymers L protein is more enriched into, uh, it's, it, it's decreasing uh, in its solubility. And in the concept or context of biomolecular condensates, this indicates the viral polymerase has higher potential to be enriched into the viral uh, replication factories when cells uh, are under stress. So uh, from these evidences, we show uh, stress treatment induced uh, change in uh, the viral protein interactions. And then I wondered if we can directly virulize the change in the structural features of viral factories directly inside the cell. So uh, with this purpose, we now come back to the technique I introduced to you at the beginning, the cellular cryo-electron tomography uh, to directly visualize the viral factory and their change um, over time of uh, stress treatment. Uh, again, this is uh, intermediate, intermediate magnification view of uh, a thin section of the cell containing a viral factory with uh, stress granule in its close proximity. And here at early time point of stress con uh, condition, we can see uh, a similar feature of the viral nucleocapsis, the filaments we have um, seen in uh, previous, and they appear to be highly curved and compact in this cytoplasmic region which do not have membranes, uh, meaning they uh, are packed in this uh, phase separated compartment. However, what's uh, most interesting to us was that while I treated the sample, uh, the, the uh, in mumps virus infected HALA cell for a longer time along the stress time course, we observed clear change in the uh, viral factory and their nucleocapsis. So first of all, we see the viral factory is getting more crowded. In these images, we can see this uh, black density is getting uh, more in the same uh, cellular volume. This was also quantified as in this plot, the black dots um, uh, of the volume fraction, uh, the volume fraction of the nucleocapsis in viral factory. So, uh, and also we can see these um, densities attaching to the surface of these nucleocapsis, which are more prominent um, when the cells are under prolonged stress condition. Uh, and the second striking discovery of 
uh, this experiment was that I observed there is morphological change of the nuclear capsids. These filaments um, convert, uh, converted from a curved state to a more straight state. And interestingly, this uh, straight conformation of the nuclear capsid is highly reminiscent of that was observed um, in um, the disease state uh, muscle biopsy uh, image of the patient. So our study actually indicates a link of the reactivation of mumps virus uh, in persistent infection to uh, the chronic diseases. So um, um, as I mentioned before, um, for this project, I developed a pipeline, a subtomogram averaging pipeline uh, to get a high resolution structure of these helical filaments, uh, which was enabled by incorporating a suite, uh, software, a suite of software packages um, named WARP, Rely on and M, uh, which were initially uh, developed for high resolution structure resolution uh, um, uh, averaging of um, the ribosome structure in bacterial cells, and um, I uh, incorporated this pipeline and modified it for resolving the helical structure to higher resolution. And uh, again, with the isolated nuclear capsids, I first uh, optimized this pipeline, um, uh, starting from segmenting of the filaments and sampling along the helical structure and aligning these uh, subvolumes and, um, and averaging them at different binning factor of the images. And in the end, I was able to resolve uh, two conformations of uh, the helical structure, which have very distinct features. So this video shows you uh, first of all, the majority class uh, of the helical structure. You can see it's helical, and here I'm showing you four subunits colored differently, and the RNA is encapsulated at the surface of the uh, helical structure. And then, uh, so enough, if we look at uh, the looming view of the structure, um, we can better visualize the uh, elements responsible for, for the assembly of this helical structure. So you can see the C-terminal domain arm region and the N-terminal domain arm region are the key elements for the assembly and the iron density can be better realized from the side. And we can see these majority and minority class actually have very different conformation, which resulted in a difference in accessibility of the RNA genome of the virus and also a flexible region at the C-terminus of the protein. So this is a better visualization of the difference between these two conformations. And the majority class uh, is, uh, contains a larger helical repeat in comparison to the minority class. Um, so this means the majority class is at a relatively open conformation uh, compared to um, the minority class uh, which is at a relatively close to confirmation. So from the looming view, we can see this is um, enabled by the rigidification of uh, a key element, the c domain arm region of the nuclear capsid protein. And the resulting uh, function is that the open confirmation actually allows more space at the surface of the helical structure for the viral genomic RNA to be more accessible to the viral polymers machinery, and also uh, more space for the C terminus of the M protein, uh, the nuclear capsid protein, to reach the surface of the helical structure in order to interact with the viral polymers machinery. So uh, th these two conformations were obtained at early time point of stress treatment. And uh, with the pipeline developed to resolve such high resolution structure, I was able later to resolve uh, the street nuclear capsids uh, directly observed in the cellular volume. So, with um, the system, uh, we, uh, so together with a master student, Sain Cheng in our group, we developed the, uh, op optimized this pipeline to uh, obtain high resolution structure uh, for cellular material as well. And the resulting structure looks like uh, looks like this. It highly resembles the open conformation of uh, the nuclear capsids from the um, 
isolated nuclear capsis at early time point of stress treatment. Um, of course, we again see the similar feature of these uh, key elements and uh, high accessibility of the biogenomic RNA and the CTMS region. And uh, um, what's interesting from uh, the cellular electron density map is that we additionally see extra density at the surface of the nuclear capsis, which was predicted to be the location of either the C terminus region of the, the nuclear capsid protein or the interacting partner protein, the viral P protein. So, this indicates again um, the straight conformation of the viral nuclear capsids observed at prolonged stress condition inside cell uh, is supporting. Um, a state for viral transcription and uh, replication. So with this, I want to conclude. Uh, we proposed uh, a working model uh, where we discovered the stress-induced transition of the persistent mumps virus infection from a basal level to an activated state. So we observed coarsening or um, yeah, the coarsening of the viral fracture along with the morphological change uh, of them, uh, especially the viral nuclear capsids. We uh, identified a uh, change in the phosphorylation level of the viral P protein, which potentially stabilize, uh, stabilizes uh, the viral polymerase together with the, uh, the conformational change of the viral nuclear capsid and high, higher accessibility of the viral genomic RNA at a prolonged stress condition. Um, altogether, they enable the reactivation of the virus um, at stress conditions. This was, of course, also um, um, orchestrated uh, by the downregulation of the host immune response, which were reviewed from uh, our quantitative mass spectrometry uh, of the host cell factors. So, I want to show you uh, from this study. Um, over the years, the efforts from our group now really enables high-resolution subtomogram averaging uh, directly for cell samples uh, at different steps. For example, we can now have a uh, micro patterning technique to better spatially control the seeding of the cells on the TM grid. And we also have automated focus on IMB meeting for preparation of the sample. Uh, and also recently, we developed a practical pipeline for directly imaging the lamella after field meaning. This provides even better, uh, higher precision of the uh, signal, fluorescent signal for correlation and targeting. And the convolutional neuronal network and aided data annotation now allows uh, high throughput data uh, mining in a less time consuming manner. And the developed a pipeline for subtomogram averaging is also now more streamlined for generating high resolution structures. So with this, I want to show you that um, we think cellular cryo-electron tomography is really a, a cross-scale technique that bridges high resolution uh, structural details all the way to um, molecular events and organelle, organelle interactions uh, inside a cell, even at tissue level, or when we incorporate even more complicated, complicated uh, cryofib technique. Uh, so to integrate it, uh, when, when integrate uh, cellular cryo-electron tomography with mass spectrometry and other techniques, now we can really resolve um, the cellular, molecular, and um, structural mechanisms underlying basic biological processes. So with this, I want to thank the entire Mahamid group uh, for support in this project, especially my mentors, Yulia Mahamid, for uh, all these advice and uh, support, and people involved in this project, the funding resource, and especially my collaborator, Misha and Sinduja, for all the mass spectrometry quantification, and uh, um, my previous supervisor, now my collaborator, Tony Hammond, in Max Planck Institute, for insights in the uh, cell biology aspect and all the support from facility people and useful discussion from the external user uh, experts. And I want to thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Sorry for the long talk. <laughs> oh, absolutely fine. Thanks a lot, um, Xiaoxie. Really great talk with a very impressive array of technologies that you presented. 
um, going all the way from the cellular scale to the to really the nano scale. Um, so that it, I think we can open the the Q and A. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and, if possible, um, ask them in person. Yeah, Brian, please go ahead. Oh, that was a Hello. absolutely fantastic absolutely fantastic mind-blowing uh talk congratulations thank you um i have a question about these uh stress fibrils right you're, you're forming these fibrils do you think these fibrils are then reconverted to make um the capsid envelope or is this just a byproduct of making too much when you're virally making all these things do you think there's another process where you make where you disassemble these fibrils or uh yeah, I hope I get your question correctly. So the filaments I'm showing or the helical structure in my slides are actually um, the templates of the virus. You know, it's a nucleocapsis, meaning we have the nucleocapsid protein as a scaffold, and then the biogenomic RNA um, sort of wrapped around at the surface, right? So um, each filament um, actually corresponds Responds to one genome of the virus. So I think, you know, for, um, for, for example, during the transcription replication procedure, of course, this serves as a template uh, and then um, synthesis of new um, nucleocapsids. So you might see um, sort of assembly, but I'm not sure if there is actually disassembly of such type of structure. Okay, yeah, thanks. Any any further questions? If if not, I, I had a question towards this of the, the, the correlative aspects, right? Because you use sure. presence microscopy to really target your tiny structures in, in really large volumes. So I was quite impressed. You, you were saying that the lamella that you're sort of like cutting away are only 200 nanometer thick, and yes. still you are accurately sort of finding finding your, your target structure with fluorescence microscopy. So can you talk a bit more on how you get this high registration accuracy? Given sure. that with a confocal microscope, still your Excel resolution is fairly poor in comparison, right? So Yes. So in the real experiment, we additionally introduce um, another channel corresponding to the fluorescent bees, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, oh, sorry, other than fluorescent bees, we again have a, a different channel of the uh, internal structure, for example, staining of the lipid droplets. So that will actually serve as our internal reference, first of all, because as you mentioned, um, due to the like the diffraction limit, right? We cannot actually have accuracy at you know two hundred nanometer with confocal, right? So actually, we use the internal reference, um, such as lipid droplet structure. Uh, to improve the accuracy for correlation because we can see both the fluorescent signal of lipid droplet and the structural feature of lipid droplet because we know they have membrane, right? Um, you can easily distinguish lipid droplet uh, in TM data. But then have you, have you sort of quantified the accuracy? I mean, in sort of... Yes, not uh, uh, my study per se, but in the paper I briefly mentioned at the end, the FIB automation, uh, paper uh, recently published from our group, Sarah, uh, uh, now a postdoc in our group, actually uh, quantified the accuracy. Um, so if we have like this such internal reference, it's relatively accurate. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, sure. I'm, I'm waiting for the raised hands. Uh, in the meantime, sort of a more general question that I maybe didn't fully get this, so when, when you were saying that, you know, the mumps virus particles are sort of like are in your HeLa cell culture, so is it always the case for your HeLa cell culture? You think it's a more general phenomenon, right? That it's already- Yeah, this is up. a very interesting question. <laughs> Initially, we really oh, thought right. uh, it's somehow randomly introduced into my cell culture. But when we later um, talked about this story to the general community, we found it was actually identified many times in yeah. other labs. So we don't know, you know, HALA cell is um, generally used uh, cell culture model across the world, but uh, right. during these 50 to 70 years, we don't know what was introduced sometimes randomly, right? So yeah. then, then likely it got introduced already earlier. 
I guess. We guess so, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> really interesting, very unexpected. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, any further questions from the audience? Yeah. I'm also happy to uh, take questions in case you want to communicate in you know emails or something. Yeah. 